the making of the costume interests you, which in and of itself is geeky. I mean, if you're really into making this sort of thing or dressing up. I, um, I don't think, I'm just going to just interject real quick. I don't think it's that hard for a chick to get laid at a con. I know. No, that's the thing. If you are a chick, if you are even a con hot chick, hot, and you walk into a con and go, does anyone want sex? Yeah. You're late. I mean, I don't have to spend hours and hours and hours and hairspray on my ass to keep something from riding up. I do not have to have a perfectly formulated Emma Frost costume, which I don't trust me. You're welcome. Um, in order to get laid at a con. And that's the thing is, well, and also the speculation that the only reason a woman would do this was for sex. Yeah, one of the no, best right. comments that I saw to get that con. <laughs> yeah. Really? No, yeah. no. It's, it's, I, New York Comic Con a few years ago, I stated that I had knowledge of the Venture Brothers and I had like three guys around me and like, what is this? Stop it. Go away. Go. I'm trying to walk. If I'm sleeping with anyone here, it's Doc Hammer. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of the best comments I saw on the whole like women spending tons of time and money to make a costume. But the one girl said, you know what? If I wanted that many guys to look at my breasts, why would I spend that much time coming up with a costume and paying the convention fee and yes. flying somewhere? I can go get a job at Hooters and get paid <laughs> for the tight t-shirt for guys to look at me. Why would I not do that if that was actually my goal? And I, I think that kind of sums it up right there. Why would anybody go to that much effort? It is, the whole thing is male gazy. The whole thing <laughs> is, that yeah. is the whole thing. Like, that's pretty much the definition of it, because the only thing that he is seeing in cosplayers is what he sees with his eyes. And what, what that makes him feel. It's not about the art of it. It's not about who knows what. It's not about geek culture. Okay. Well, you get this argument where it's actually like, oh, well, guys are the only ones who read comics. And so then when girls are complaining about the scanty costumes, they're like, oh, but the comics are for guys anyway. And right. then, and then the girls find a character that's a female character they want to play, and the only option is a scanning costume because that's... Yeah, that's yeah, actually... I actually hear that all the time. Yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah, well, this is for guys anyway. And people have said that on my page before. And that's something that I had written about in my notes, actually. That's a huge point. Like, this, this culture and this art form is something that girls have to na navigate from outside of. You enter it being a woman but it's already been written for you. Like, the narrative of comics has been written by men. The culture has been written by men. So as a female, you have to insert yourself and then begin navigating, but you're not allowed to talk about how that makes you feel. You can't write about women without with excluding their voices, which is what's happening all the time. But on the bright side, I mean, I will, I don't, you know, this isn't overwhelmingly negative, and going along with Tony Harris being an ass, um, is the fact that there are a lot of creators who are trying to make it more welcoming for women. And there's um, there's Kelly Sue DeConnick, who's writing Captain Marvel right now, who's fantastic. There is uh, Gil Simone, who is working in DC, is writing Batgirl and the Movement. And um, you've got, a, you know, and because it's still fairly difficult for women to break into the business, there's actually a lot of guys who have been doing a lot more. Uh, Karen Gillen and Jamie McKelvey. I think McKelvey did the redesign of Carol's costume. I'm not sure. Um, one of them did. <laughs> yeah, you actually got me on that one. Okay, um, but like recently, Matt Fraction, who is married to Kelly Sue DeConnick, um, and is doing the fantastic Hot Guy book right now. So if you are read Hot Guy, it's great. Um, Hot Guy, Hot Guy. <laughs> there's a whole there's an in joke about it. Um, but he was recently on Tumblr contacted by someone who said that she cosplays at cons and people have gone after her about being a bigger girl to cosplays and says, we don't want to see you know, girls like you cosplay and why would you do this? And he wrote a form letter for her and put it online and it said basically, get over yourself, you know, present this to anyone that gives you trouble, get over yourself, love, not fraction. And it has been circulated, and I mean, and this is great to see this, you know, this creator who is successful, nominated for multiple Eisners this year, which is a huge deal, saying, you know what, this is fun, and this is what these people want to do back off. This the, is not your business. The good news is that it's like 70-30 in the favor of the good fight. Yes. <laughs> like, yes. like, it's not, there's, 
we're not talking about something that's like if the more that we talk about it, the better it gets, and that's been proven. Like it's since the Tony Harriet Harris incident, which was like a while ago now. It was ago, not, yeah, it was a while ago, but it keeps getting better and better. And that could be proven by you can go to any forum about comics on the internet and start a conversation about geek girls, and you will see about 70, 30 people commenting that are like, D depending on the forum. <laughs> okay, bleeding pool is actually what I was thinking about. Okay. That's about 70 days right now. As a sense of perspective, someone who's going to the conventions for 30 years, you have no idea how much better it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there, there I were, mean, I'm only 10 years. There were three women at the first convention I went to, mm. and they were there with their husbands on. <laughs> it's just, it's unbelievable the difference in the population of fandom. Yeah, and the more it gets speak. talked about, the more it increases, yeah. so it gets yeah. better. And, and, I, and I've seen this happen consistently. We have a whole section on conventions coming up. We do. So. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so because we were talking about um, strong female characters, you wanted me to remind you to talk about Ellen Ripley. Oh, yeah. That's the <laughs> ultimate. Someone, said, someone, someone threw out a question the other day on Twitter, who is the ultimate feminist action character? And I said Ellen Ripley. And then I thought, oh, I should say something about that at the panel. If anyone is ever looking for a great example of a really strong woman, um, in action, Ellen Ripley, because written and directed the part by a man. was written and directed by a man. That part was actually written for a guy. And Sigourney Weaver, Weaver went in and auditioned for it, and they were like, this is Ripley, this is our Ripley, and put her in the role. And aside from the fact that Sigourney Weaver just kicks so much ass in the alien movies, it's never, there is never a compromise for her being female. It's not there are never, there is, there, yeah, there's, there's just no gender reference. She's female, and that's, that's it. Other than the fact that she's obviously female, it's never commented on. There are there is never a moment where she's grumpy and someone makes a joke about her period. <laughs> there, is never, there is never even the relationship that she has when she is when she is pregnant in the movies. The relationship that she has with that is, is simply a human parent relationship. She doesn't become this crumbling bundle of emotion that can't function because of all of her hormones and all of these other stereotypes that I personally find kind of offensive that are out there when they put a woman in an action movie or in a strong role. She tends to constantly have to compromise her humanity for her femininity, especially her biological femininity, her hormones and all these things. So I just want to toss that out there if you haven't seen Alien, if that's possible. <laughs> there can't be anybody in this it. room who yes. hasn't seen Alien. I love that you mentioned that. You should see it. I remember when that the year that came out, just bef before I went to see it, I, was like, I, was I remember reading a review, and the reviewer compared the relationship between Ripley and Newt to Indiana Jones and Short Run. How, how there was a the, the maternal thing. They, he just made a, a comparison. That's, so that was before I saw it. Then I saw it. In my mind, I've always linked those two movies because of that. Yeah. And Everything you said, I totally agree with. Like I, I was, I remember because I and I was one of the few people who had not seen the original Alien. I, so the first one movie in that series I saw was actually Aliens, and uh, in my that's why I have a bias. I always pref I prefer that movie, to, and uh, and I agree. Like she's a, she just is a great character. Yeah, she's a great person. Yeah, but it's never. It never it's has not to be a great female. female. Even female. even in her relationship with New, mm -hmm. she is nurturing. She is parent-like. She is protective. But there is a tendency in all media to portray a mother with her children as crazy in some way. You don't know what she's gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> and granted, of course, the parental urge, especially with a woman who gives birth to the child, that biological urge is very strong. But it doesn't make us take leave of our senses and become nutcases. And that tends to be where that portrayal goes. Um, you know, it's kind of like the old story of the mom lifting the car off her kid. It like. They, that's used as a vehicle for so much in so much media with women, and that's, that's frustrating to me. And even that itself can be used well. And I'm going to throw out Harry Potter, Molly Weasley, when the oh, Bellatrix is that's strange, that's 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 as hell. <laughs> and, and just, you know, Molly out of nowhere, get away from my daughter, you bitch. And this has been Molly the housewife, and, and I saw people complain when that happened mm -hmm. because, oh, it was Molly Weasley the housewife killing the most, you know, badass woman in the dark side. And I'm like, yes, that's the point. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's a good example of how it can be done. And they missed yeah. the, uh, 
the foreshadowing that said that she was a very powerful witch. Right. Throughout several books previously. I think they, they ignored that. <laughs> um, <laughs> that was the part I was looking forward to most of that was Yeah, yes. everybody was yes. waiting yes. for her to get her. I was looking forward to that, that Holly most did it. in a movie. Yes, and that was that was one of those moments in a book to me other media translation that you're hoping gets shown because everybody was saying, are they going to have to cut that line? Are they not going to leave that in? Of course they kept it in. It's um, they had to. I can't talk about the Game of Thrones one because people might not have seen it, so yeah. I'm just going <laughs> to shut my mouth on that one. But um, yeah, it was one of those moments that if you had cut it out, it would have taken so much away from it, and so you know. And the point of maternal love through the whole Harry Potter series being so important and, and managing to make the idea of there is this love shield around you because your mother cared about you that has been protecting you for all these years and making it work without making it like, oh, really, a love shield? That's where we're going with this? Um, so. I just want to skip back to Ellen Ripley real quick. And I'm just doing a quick audit in my brain, and they don't, they don't really go, like, sexy with her. Like, there's a, in the first one, before the mother issues and stuff, like, they, she does strip down to her bra and panties to blow the creature out of the thing. But other than like that, any normal human. But, yeah. but it's not <laughs> sexualized in any no. way. Yeah. It is, well, I have all this extra clothing, I need to get rid of this now. And then in the second yeah, one, she actually puts so more clothes on to fight the <laughs> queen. Like, she gets a big power on her on. I know, it's like, where's her <laughs> part? It, it gets more murky <laughs> around the third one, though. And the third does one. The the full, she's on the all-male prison planet. They attempt to rape her. She does have... Her relationship with the doctor does get physical, so they do address her sensuality, mm -hmm. but like they do seem to do it from the same point that Jonathan Demme uses in Silence of the Lambs, where it's like showing us how men look at her and unsettling us that yeah. way. It shows a very different male gaze instead of like a romanticized mm -hmm. male gaze. It right. is almost like a creepified mm -hmm. male gaze. Like, <laughs> look at how normal and yet creepy this is for these guys. But also, it, like when she does strip down, it's kind of functional. It's not like I right. like yeah. matching bra and panties on. Like she's not. Yeah. Like, <laughs> <laughs> It's like the exact in that scene opposite. in Star Trek when I saw that. That was the I loved the movie. That was the one thing that disappointed me. And my first thought was, wow, that's really not practical. <laughs> Starship, like that's like some Victoria's Secret lace like, stuff. <laughs> yeah. she wear? And I mean that all ties into the bigger argument of like what women are wearing when they're supposedly going into battle. Like, yeah. like, <laughs> men get armor. Women well, get the boob oh, the yes. Yeah. That's, well, yeah. And you bringing up that thing with the, the Alice Eve, that was the one thing that disappointed you. There were people that wrote about that and basically stressed, I loved the rest of the movie, but this scene sucked. And people were like, well, if you, if you hated the movie so much, why are you talking about it? <laughs> but no, 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 no. I liked the rest of the movie, but this scene Then why'd you watch it? <laughs> Because I couldn't close my eyes until after I'd already... What is wrong with you? <laughs> and that's the problem with trying to talk about anything I like this. Yeah, the yeah. silencing treatments you get, where you can... Str and I have written about things where I have stressed over and over and over again. I loved everything about this, but this... And people will jump on that one thing you disliked. Like, you're just being a picky feminist, and what's wrong with you? And this media isn't designed for you. And... Um, that's another thing that we really need to understand that like when we talk about these things it's not meant as um i think it makes people really defensive and, yeah. and i think it's because we live in a culture where debate has really become something that like if you're talking about somebody's favorite thing you're like why are you attacking me why are you attacking me but like that's not what it is like we can still have conversations and debates about these things and talk about how we feel about things without Everybody's favorite is problematic in some way. Everybody likes something that is problematic. Everyone up here likes something that's problematic. Like, just talking about it doesn't mean that we can't enjoy it. Right. We're there's nothing consuming. wrong. There's nothing wrong with enjoying problematic media. The problem is when you ignore the fact that there are problematic aspects to that media, and when someone says something to you about it, you try to insist that that problem isn't there. That just it's, erases people further than they've already been erased. Like, you know, I I liked this show except for these strange decisions that were made about having a supposedly heroic character attempt to rape another supposedly heroic character. We might be talking about Buffy. Um, we might be talking about Buffy. 
Buffy. And, you know, there are. I have read, you know, with Buffy and with any Joss Whedon media, I have read so much about, like, arguing back and forth in favor of him as a feminist or as a faux feminist. And it's like, you know what? There's stuff that he really gets about female characters and that he really latches onto and does so well. And then there's stuff that you just want to take him aside and be like, oh, Joss, honey, no. Stop. <laughs> You're doing good. I'm going to give you a pat on the hand. But this has got to stop. Um, and he does have some weird fixation on rape sometimes, which I don't get. But, um, but yeah, and it's, it's you know. And then there's the argument that we shouldn't accept flawed feminist media just because it's all we have. And it's it's like, no, we can look at this media and say, okay, this is for the most part feminist because what has this have no way to tie. I'm still going to enjoy and argue in favor of the fact that he did a show called Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which centers around a strong woman, around her strong friendships and relationships with people, and refusing to sacrifice those just because she also happened to be the one chosen to save the world. But I'm still sometimes going to go, what? The spike thing was a mistake, Joss goes in. <laughs> if I ever get to make Joss Wien go sit. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna wheel us in, get us back on on topic. We're gonna um. Sorry. All panels lead towards me. So, uh, does anyone want to comment any further on the the cosplay aspect of um, this Harris character's comments or? For, for Jess, is there anything else that you want to talk yeah. about in the world of cosplay and the issues that we haven't touched on? Um, I think you guys actually are pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> you know? What do you think would make I mean, things better? Like, what do you think would make a more welcoming environment for cosplayers? Um, just basically respect for others. And, um, I mean, as far as, um, like, I just think women want just keep doing, to, like, take pictures with them. It's not like you come to the con, like, you're coming to the con as your favorite character, so if somebody comes up and wants you to take a picture, you like that. So it's not like mm -hmm. people, people avoiding you. You just want people to be respectful. Yeah, it's just, it's just the more respectful things. I mean, some of the things, that I saw an interview on YouTube, and I forget who, she was dressed like the black cat. Did you see that? Yeah, the one where they were asking her the really awful questions. Yeah, and they just kept focusing in on her uh, breasts, you know. Oh, yeah. uh, did you, I mean, ha, are you guys familiar with the black cat's costume? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm trying to think of, I can't remember I what she said, but there was Jesus some... says enough, and she walked away, and then the guy, the whoever was doing the interview was dumbfounded. He, he was shocked. He's like, well, I thought that's what she was here for, was for us yeah. to focus on her boobs, you know? <laughs> so does that go into the whole con safety issue that I know? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, we're going to talk about that, yeah. I think, I've never been to a con, I'm kind of like, on the outside of all of this a little bit, but I think it's really interesting that you take in a form where it was meant to be inclusionary, like, hey, we're all in this, we all like this, and then you're now excluding people mm -hmm. like, for a certain reason. It's also weird that it's in, within a culture that became formed because people felt like they were outcasts. Exactly, like, so. you're, you're now <laughs> outcasting people from within. Right. Yeah. It's yeah. like you became the cool kid, so yeah. now it's okay for you to exclude other people. Oh, so yes. oh, oh sorry. I'm sorry. Um, oh, I've heard a number of people that the, the first conventions were Star Trek conventions started by chicks because they dug Star Trek and wanted to go have conventions. And so women started geek conventions. And now it's like. History of invisible women. <laughs> <laughs> Sue Storm? Yes. <laughs> Not in the refrigerator. <laughs> I don't want Sue Storm in my refrigerator, especially with Jessica Alba. Or would you know she's just like, I'm never opening my fridge again now. I'm going to open my fridge and scream, get out of there, Sue. It's going to be really weird at work. We're going to go ahead and just ride your, your wave into conventions. Right. So, uh, Kristen, I think that you That's me. are going to explain. Yeah. Um, Oh, before before I get into conventions, I had just one anecdote that I wanted to say. Um, when we posted this panel on, actually one of our very favorite comic stores was trying to help us out, posted the the event on their page, and I can't say any names because we don't have screenshots. I really wish that we did. But when it was posted, there was this dude named Joe Peacock. You may recognize that name if you have any like sort of stake in this. Um, 
he caused a big kerfuffle about cosplay people too by making some comments. But the event was posted, and he commented, "Man." Well, right, 